With World War II going full swing in Europe, the US Navy was rapidly mobilising itself for war. By autumn of 1941, the first tranche of the Essex class, large fleet carriers unrestricted by the constraints of the interwar treaties, were already under construction. But these ships would not, it was thought at the time, be available for quite a few years, and it seemed pre-war concerns about carrier vulnerability were being borne out in the European theatre. When the war had begun, the Royal Navy technically had the largest carrier fleet. The Imperial Japanese Navy in 1939 had Hosho, Akagi, Kaga, Ryujo, Soryu and Hiryu, the US Navy had Lexington, Saratoga, Ranger, Yorktown and Enterprise, since Langley had been converted to a seaplane tender, whilst the British had Argus, Hermes, Eagle, Courageous, Glorious, Furious and Ark Royal. Each navy also had ships that had entered service since September 1939. Hornet and Wasp for the US Navy, Shikaku and Zuikaku for the Imperial Japanese Navy, plus a number of quick conversions from merchant hulls, and illustrious, formidable, victorious, and indomitable for the Royal Navy. However, in the course of the conflict up to this point, the Royal Navy had lost Courageous, Glorious, and Ark Royal. While only the toughness inherent to the design of illustrious and formidable had kept them afloat under exceptionally heavy bombing attacks in the Mediterranean. Such was the need for carriers that even the old Argus, which had been a training ship before the war, was being used for convoy escort and other frontline missions. It was thus rapidly becoming clear to some in the US Navy that the pre war practice of training Navy pilots on land and then moving them on to active fleet carriers for at sea training and qualification might run into the two problems of, at best, every carrier hull being in demand on the front line, which is not perhaps the best place to be training pilots in basics like how to land on a moving target, or at worst, they might find themselves down half the carrier fleet or possibly more before the first Essex class hull hit the water and landing on a carrier that's several miles under the ocean is notoriously difficult. On top of that, war with Japan, which was looking more and more likely, would probably also mean war with Germany, which in turn meant that even if Ranger, which was judged as unsuitable for Pacific operations, was used to train pilots in the Atlantic, there was a reasonable chance she'd be sunk by U-boats. Given the range of Japanese submarines, even moving her across to operate off the US west coast might only change the flag of the submarine that hit her. It was into this environment that then Commander, later Admiral, R.F. Whitehead, stationed up at the Great Lakes, came up with a cunning plan. Build a training carrier to operate on Lake Michigan, since the presence of enemy naval or air assets there would signify far larger problems than the possible interruption of a pilot training program. Because of this, a carrier stationed here would not need guns, armour, torpedo defences, or even armed escorts. It could operate pretty much at will, could fully use her radio equipment, including any homing devices or other similar new technologies that might be coming along without giving anything away or being homed in on by enemy craft, and the ship could be based out of Chicago, which already had two naval training schools and a naval air station, and one of the schools was even a large naval aviation mechanics school, which would form a neat symbiotic arrangement. Trainee pilots were of course much more likely to break things, and the mechanics school would therefore benefit from a constant supply of realistically broken aircraft to play with and try to fix, which, if they were fixable, could then be sent back into the training program. And given that this was the Great Lakes, it could also furnish all kinds of hostile environment training. You might be half a continent away from the sea, but that didn't mean you couldn't regularly be provided with storms, hail, heaving waves, freezing temperatures, ice on the water, and sometimes all of them at once. The only wrinkle in this otherwise flawless plan was that 
By the time the US Navy approved the plan, the Rising Sun Express Sunday delivery service had brought the US into the war on December 7th, 1941, and thus all US fleet carriers were unsurprisingly called to active duty, and in any case the dimensions of the Welland Canal would have prevented any of them from reaching the lake, whatever their circumstances, but those same canal restrictions also meant that no large ship capable of conversion into a decent-sized carrier could be brought up from Atlantic harbours either. And that meant the solution had to come from the shipyards on the lakes themselves. Building a whole new carrier was out of the question. It would take far too long, and whilst the canal was too small for capital ships, the shipbuilders of the Great Lakes were being called upon to supply all manner of smaller warships and merchant ships for the war effort, which meant that occupying one of the larger slipways for several years was doubly unacceptable. But, thanks to the sheer size of the Great Lakes, another solution was possible. Large ships had already been built there, so they could just find one of them and convert it. This was something the US had actually got recent experience with, thanks to making the first generation of escort carriers, which were basically conversions from various pre-existing hulls. And so the hunt began for a suitable victim, I, I mean, volunteer. The recommended specs were quite basic. The ship had to be long and stable enough to support at least a 500-foot flight deck, and the ship had to be capable of a speed of around 18 knots, or ideally a bit better. An inventory of available shipping gradually narrowed down to two primary choices. The car ferry SS City of Midland, and the sightseeing steamer SS CNB. Of the two, CNB was larger, faster, and essentially a luxury vessel, and thus didn't contribute all that much to the wartime production efforts, whereas the city of Midland was being used, in part, to move vehicles that had been produced in the local area closer to east coast ports and railheads for shipping to the front lines. CNB had another advantage. She was a paddle wheeler, with a wheel mounted either side of her hull, and that meant that she was quite stable and also slightly less likely to chew up aircraft and pilots that failed to properly take off and then got run over. But the only downside was that CNB had been built in the early 1910s, and with no particular ambitions at high speed, she wasn't capable of breaking even 20 knots, she had been built with coal-fired engines. And that meant someone was going to get stuck shoveling coal again, a couple of decades after the US battle fleet had phased that particular onerous duty out. Nonetheless, she was duly acquired for about three quarters of a million dollars in March 1942, and the process of demolishing several decks of beautifully opulent and expensive fittings and furniture was begun. As this work went on, the scale of the US carrier training program was being ramped up considerably. With the laying down of additional waves of Essex-class carriers, the conversion of several Cleveland-class light cruisers into Independence-class light fleet carriers, and the sometimes eye-watering attrition rates of trained carrier pilots that were occurring in the opening months of the war, at least when you compared killed in action plus missing in action plus those invalided out of the service to the total pool of qualified frontline pilots that were available at the start of the war, not to mention the flight decks that were becoming available thanks to the escort carrier program, it was quite clear that even more pilots would be needed than had been anticipated. Plus, having another ship meant that, in theory, you would be able to chain their deployments to ensure long, continuous periods of training, whereas one ship might need to refuel or might even need to stop for a few days for maintenance and thus miss a few good weather days, only to then be ready to sail when zero visibility fog banks rolled in, having two ships meant that you could at least conduct flight operations during those good weather days when the other one was down. And so, a new search began. This time, the net was cast slightly wider to include ships operated by companies with good profit margins – 
part of the reason that C&B had been selected was that her owners were a little short of cash, and the Navy thus had reckoned they could get a bargain price for her whereas a company with a healthy balance sheet would probably want a lot more proportionally for one of their working cash-generating assets. This new search led them to the SS Greater Buffalo, an even larger and slightly faster ship that had been designed and built about a decade after CNB by the same marine architect. She too was an all-steel side paddle wheeler with coal-fired boilers, and so less than a week before CNB was due to commission, Greater Buffalo was acquired and sent to the same shipyard, that of the rather generic but helpfully unconfusingly named American Shipbuilding Company, for conversion, and work on her began just as work on the CNB was wrapping up. You can see her off to the left in this photo. SS CNB thus emerged on the 12th of August 1942 as the USS Wolverine the world's first coal-fired paddle-wheel aircraft carrier. Without the need for a hangar, the flight deck was a pedestrian 26 feet above the water. A landing at that height would faceplant you into the floor of the hangar deck on a regular fleet carrier, but since of course you're supposed to aim for the flight deck markings anyway, this particular variation in height wasn't held to make much difference for pilot qualification. The width of the flight deck, on the other hand, was considerable. It had been sponsored out to cover the paddle wheels, more to keep them from being damaged by rough landings and aircraft going over the side than anything else, but as a result, the flight deck was almost as wide as that found on an actual fleet carrier. An island had been constructed on the starboard side, both for aesthetic reasons and to give a more realistic representation of what it was like to actually land on a proper carrier, plus it gave them somewhere to trunk all the boilers to. This was positioned just forward of the starboard paddle wheel. A basic signal mast rose above the island, and the flight deck turned out to be almost 560 feet long, thanks to a rather considerable stern overhang and a slightly smaller one at the bow. This was, of course, considerably shorter than the flight deck you might find on a Yorktown or Lexington class carrier, but it was about the same length as the one you might find on an independence class, and it was 50 to 100 foot longer than what you'd find on an escort carrier, depending on which particular class of escort carrier you're looking at. Unfortunately for the crew, the luxury wood panelled accommodation of the original ship was gone, but the remaining spaces were still relatively roomy for the new crew, and included a reasonable sized cinema which was primarily for showing instructional films. The relatively inexperienced nature of the expected pilots was reflected in the installation of no less than eight arrestor wires strung across the flight deck, plus a raisable barrier. A few of those wires were there to catch the pilots who actually landed properly in the right place, whilst the majority were there to ensure that those who overshot, mostly at least, wouldn't end up in the lake. The name Wolverine had been selected for the ship in part because it would be operating on Lake Michigan, and Michigan is known as the Wolverine State. Some initial issues were experienced on the shakedown voyage, mostly centred around the engineering crew not actually knowing how to properly stoke the coal-fired boilers, but once these were resolved, she was soon ready for service. The conversion work on the Greater Buffalo proceeded in a fairly similar manner, except that Wolverine had been completed with a wooden flight deck similar to US fleet carriers, whilst the newly renamed USS Sable would be a little bit more experimental. She would trial two different types of steel flight deck across the length of the total flight deck, and in good quality overhead shots, or shots that include a good portion of the middle and forward sections of the flight deck, she's also instantly recognisable as distinct from her half-sister, by the varied shades of the flight deck, which, as you can see, are divided into a number of rectangles and squares. Now, this isn't because they'd run out of paint and were forced to use slightly different shades all over the place, but rather each of those sections represents one of eight types of non-skid coatings which were needed on a steel flight deck, which were all being simultaneously tried for effectiveness and durability. <laughs> 
Sable would take somewhat longer to commission, as work on her was still ongoing when the winter really closed in, and so she would commission in May 1943. That left Wolverine as Queen of the Lake for the summer and autumn of 1942. A couple of weeks before she entered service, the unit that would supervise training aboard her was commissioned itself. But it ran into a few problems almost immediately as Naval Air Station Glenview, its official base, was just a little busy with various other training programs. And this meant that trainee pilots had to compete for both takeoff and landing slots, as well as hangar space. Luckily, there was another runway nearby at Orchard Place. This was slightly less heavily used, as it was attached to a Douglas aircraft plant which made C-54 Skymaster transports, so as long as you dodged the occasional four-engine giant undergoing flight trials, you should be fine. Later on, you also need to learn to keep your mouth shut and your eyes strictly on the approach vectors, as that particular site was also home to a great many experimental aircraft and most of the United States Army Air Force's array of captured enemy aircraft. Incidentally, it would be this airfield that would later form the basis for Chicago's O'Hare International Airport in the post-war period. Two other fields, first Allendale and then later briefly Elgin, were also acquired as intermediate sites. Glenview and Orchard Place would be where the aircraft were based, whereas Allendale, and it was hoped Elgin, would be purely for trainees. They would be painted up to simulate carrier decks, without, of course, the problems of the deck moving, or potentially the pilot falling into the sea. And then, once the pilots have proved they could reliably land on the small, fixed, non-moving rectangle, they would be allowed to head out to Wolverine to try their hand at the real thing. And so, Wildcats, Dauntlesses, and other aircraft started to appear in the skies over Lake Michigan and Wolverine began feeding a steady supply of interestingly broken aircraft to the mechanics school. Some aircraft just flat out missed the carrier entirely. Others somehow managed to get to the deck, but miss every one of the arrestor wires and end up tipping over the side. Uh, still others stayed on the deck, but managed to do so in so violent a manner that the aircraft was quite clearly a write-off. All of these would end up on the bottom of the lake, the latter pushed over the side to make room for further flight operations. Although measures were quickly put in place to prevent that last loss, as we'll see in a minute. The other addition to the lakebed architecture would, of course, be the occasional failed takeoff, which operation was, of course, necessary to attempt if you wanted to get home again. Only those aircraft which had landed, broken themselves, but were repairable got to sail back to port at the end of the day, and then the pilot got to watch their plane be craned off for extensive examination, and of course mockery, by the mechanics school. As such, one of the best places to find a World War II aircraft that nobody currently owns is, actually of all places, the lake bed of Lake Michigan. Quite a number of wrecks, about three dozen or so, have already been salvaged, and you will need a fair bit of patience but there are still somewhere between 60 and 260 out there. Operations on the lake were somewhat curtailed in mid-December 1942 when the lake partially froze, which stranded poor old Wolverine five miles offshore like a latter-day Erebus for a couple of days. This phase of flight operations had granted 287 pilots their wings. Hoping to continue training whilst they waited for the ice to clear, the US Navy shipped the flight school off to California, which is not known for its icy weather, where they utilised the services of the escort carriers Long Island and Core. But these ships were less stable in both pitch and roll than Wolverine, which was a little bit of a problem for new pilots, and all the other problems that we mentioned at the start of the video with regards to needing escort and not using your radio all that much, etc., etc., also reared their heads. The net result, in a roughly similar time period to the first operational period for Wolverine, was that despite using two carriers, they qualified slightly fewer pilots, 240, and there was massively increased running costs. <laughs> 
And so in March 1943, the training unit was back on the Great Lakes, and Wolverine set sail on the 17th of March to resume operations, to be joined, of course, by Sable a couple of months later. A lighter with a rather large crane, the Commerce, was made available to shuttle supplies, people, and the more damaged aircraft that previously might have been deep-sixed to and from the shore, as well as occasionally fishing an aircraft off the flight deck when it had only partially fallen over the side and was getting in the way. Two small cabin cruisers, the Lark and Peregrine, rode shotgun to fish pilots out of the lake when the inevitable splash landing occurred, and some bright spark also located an icebreaker to lead the ships around when needed, as neither Wolverine nor Sable were equipped to plough through ice flows. With these measures in place, not even the terrible 44-45 winter, which froze the lake over the horizon from the shore, would impede training from continuing. The usual routine would see a full squadron take off and assemble over the southern lake shore, the leader would then signal whichever paddle carrier was out that day, or if both were, then the one they'd been assigned, and upon acknowledgement and some direction to where the carrier was, the squadron would proceed to make their landing attempts one at a time. Now that both ships were at hand, this training cycle could proceed seven days a week. Often, both ships would be found out on the lake, occasionally dropping down to one when the other needed coaling or repairs. For the ships, it was an early start. They had to head out to open water at 0300, as otherwise their combined smoke output when firing up the boilers would have covered much of the early morning commuting population in ash, grit, and other undesirable things. This also ensured that they were far enough out onto the lakes that landing operations could take place without running too close to any active shipping channels. The operations themselves would start at 0800 promptly, assuming there was sufficient light. Once aboard, the pilots would be debriefed, onboard training would be conducted, any repairs that were needed and could be made aboard were made, and those who needed to be retrieved and dried off from the lake were duly treated. Then flight ops could be resumed. By the mid to late afternoon, the last operational aircraft would take off again and return to land. As time went on, a combination of the stokers gaining experience and better quality coal being provided reduced the ship's smoke output, which made the landing approaches somewhat easier, as early attempts had sometimes been foiled by thick clouds of black smoke, since the ships had to sail directly into the wind. They lacked the speed to conduct flight operations without wind over the deck, and they didn't have the speed on their own to turn slightly away from the wind, which would have allowed them to redirect the smoke. Landing in a crosswind was also seen as slightly unsporting to throw at newbies. The ships would then spend the day heading generally north against the prevailing wind whilst flight operations were underway, turning around and coming back once the last aircraft had launched. The weather was really the only operational problem for the ships. If the wind was low, or worse, still, then the bigger and more advanced aircraft like Hellcats and Avengers couldn't really safely land or take off, and so on still days, Texan trainers would be used instead. A pilot initially needed to make eight successful landings and takeoffs to qualify, although this would be extended to 14 as time went on. Fortunately, the original forecast qualification rate of 30 pilots per day went up to well over 60 after a year of both ships operating, which meant that even with the increased number of takeoffs and landings required per pilot, they were still qualifying more pilots over a given month in 1944 and 45 than they had in 1942 or 43. One of these pilots included one George H. W. Bush, who, at age 18, would receive his qualification aboard USS Sable. Fairly soon into operations, some bright spark also realised that with all these flight operations taking place, it was the perfect opportunity to train deck crew. And so, with the help of some experienced officers who'd come over from carriers that had been sunk in 1942, a variety of flight deck roles were added to the training roster. Also present at various points were pilots from the fleet air arm. In the mid to late war, Wildcats, Avengers, Corsairs, and a few Hellcats were part of the Royal Navy's arsenal, 
and so fitting its pilots into the existing testing and training program made a lot of sense. Sable would also be the test bed for the top secret twin engined attack drones that the US Navy experimented with later in the war, and which Rex's hangar has done a very interesting video on. You can see some of them here aboard Sable, including one or two whose flight profiles, shall we say, were a little bit questionable. But hey, that's what product testing is for. Of course, all good things do have to come to an end, and with the Japanese surrender, the need for Wolverine and Sable also came to an end. The US Navy now had more carriers than it knew what to do with, and without the threat of war, and thus submarines, future training and qualification could be done on a fleet carrier, as per the pre-war programs. The services rendered by the two ships were neatly summed up in a letter from the Chief of Naval Air Operations Training, which in part reads thus. The USS Wolverine and the USS Sable have at all times been maintained in an efficient state of readiness and have qualified a total of 17,820 pilots for carrier duty. The skill and resourcefulness, the spirit of enthusiasm and teamwork demonstrated by all officers and men have made possible this high rate of carrier qualification commensurate with safety of operations. For the vital role in the mission of this command, the Chief of Naval Air Operations Training desires to extend to all officers and men his appreciation for a job well done and a heartfelt and warm farewell to our Great Lakes carriers. Both Wolverine and Sable would be decommissioned in early November 1945 and offered back to their original owners as per the contracts that had purchased them specified. But of course, the cost of turning them back into the floating palaces they'd been would have been absurdly high for private entities, especially as they would have had to recoup all those costs from the public later on, and so other uses for them in their current state were suggested. Car ferries being quite a popular suggestion, thanks to the approximately 50,000 square feet of flight deck space, which was enough to accommodate over 500 typical cars of the period with room to spare, which these days, I suppose, would correspond to a dozen F-350s, three Dodge Rams and a Hummer. Or alternatively, as floating nightclubs, right up until somebody realised the flight deck made a great dance floor, but the lack of safety railing on the edges made for great liability suits when someone inevitably got a little too drunk and fell off the side. And so, without any realistic prospect of further use, both Wolverine and Sable would be sold for scrapping in 1947 and 1948, respectively. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.